Hi gang, Tamsin here. I have an obsession with all things history, mystery, conspiracy, and paranormal. And I love to do a deep dive on topics I often stumble across surely by chance. And I love to tell tales. So welcome to Sit and Spin. Today, we're going to talk about the Hex Hollow murders. These happened in the 20s and 30s in Pennsylvania. Now, since it's finally summer type weather in Canada and we get so little of it, I am outside. The mosquitoes and black flies can get a little ridiculous. So if you see me doing this, it's because the flies are coming to get me. And as you can see, we are still in lockdown here in Ontario. So I still have crazy hair till I can get to my hairdresser. Because honestly, if I try to do it, I'm going to look like a badly shorn sheep. So for today, I am going to spin this lovely braid I dyed up with the amethyst purple and I called it Amazon green because I labeled the jar Amazon green. It's not Amazon green. It's coral reef aqua. As far as the bleeding goes, I was thinking of the right dye. I was just using the wrong name. So this is amethyst purple and coral reef aqua just going to do a nice easy spin with this chill out here in the sunshine I'm going to adjust you so you can see the pen back here this is where the cats can come you want to see spoiled I'll show you they have a run that goes all the way up to the house to the catio and they also have a tunnel off the house so they can come in and out as they want so I expect them to show up in the cage because they generally like to come down here and wrestle around in the grass so I'm going to uh, adjust the camera and let's spin a yarn. Rhymer's Hollow, also known as Hex Hollow, is located in central Pennsylvania near the Maryland border. The area was brought to national attention by a murder that occurred there in 1928. And like the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s, it set off hysteria about hex magic and witchcraft. Let's have a look at what happened. Pennsylvania hex magic dates back to the earliest days of the colony. Though there were a great many different religious denominations among the original German settlers, there was a common tradition of folk magic practiced by all except the plain Dutch, such as the Amish, who rejected the practice. For large numbers of these Germans, the belief in folk magic was entwined with their Christian beliefs. On one end of the folk magic scale was powwowing, nothing to do with the Native American ceremonial practice of the same name. Powwowers were folk medicine practitioners who drew their healing power from God. Powwowers treated illnesses, provided protection from evil, removed hexes and curses, located lost objects, animals, and people, foretold the future, and provided good luck charms. They used amulets, incantations, prayers, and rituals. It was believed that anyone could powwow, but members of certain families were especially adept at it. These families passed the traditions down from generation to generation. Of course, there's the other end of the scale, the Hexerai, witchcraft, pr practitioners of black magic that drew their power from the devil or other ungodly sources, and they were often called Hex Doctors. They harassed neighbors and committed criminal acts with supernatural powers. The term Hex Doctor was at times applied to powwowers, who were also knowledgeable in the ways of Hexerai and were skilled at battling witches and removing curses. These Hex Doctor powwowers fell into a gray area between a witch and a powwower. It was not uncommon for someone to seek out one Hex Doctor to remove the curse of another. For many, powwowers and witches could not easily be placed into categories. Many labeled the use of any folk magic as witch witchcraft and that was strictly forbidden by their religious beliefs. With powwowers and hexadopters often working against each other, the common person was caught in the middle. It was in this setting that folk magic flourished for more than two centuries. Since both types of practitioners depended on charms, formulas, and incantations, they often collected them into recipe books, which contained the collective knowledge of a family line. By the middle 1800s, there were published volumes that came into common usage. Folk healers increasingly supplemented their knowledge with sources published by other powwowers. 
John George Hommen collected and published the most famous volume called Der Langverborgagin. I don't know, I don't speak German. Oh, Der Langverborgagin Freund, or The Long Lost Friend. But we'll just call it that because that's easier to say. He published it in 1819. The compilation of spells, charms, prayers, remedies, and folk medicine was the first book of powwow magic to achieve wide circulation. It has been in print in either German or English continuously since 1820. Over time, the book itself became a talisman. In the front of each edition was an inscription that read, quote, Whoever carries this book with him is safe from all enemies, visible and invisible. And whoever has this book with him cannot die without the holy corpse of Jesus Christ, nor drown in any water, nor burn up in any fire, nor can any unjust sentence be passed upon him, so help me." End quote. Of course, there had to be a dark counter to this book, a far, far more dangerous book of witchcraft, the sixth and seventh books of Moses. Drawn from the tradition of European grimoires and ceremonial magic, the sixth and seventh book of Moses were purported to have been written by Moses himself and allegedly contained secret knowledge that could not be included in the Bible. Described as two separate books that were published together, they first appeared in Pennsylvania in 1849 and soon gained an evil reputation. The text provided instructions on how to conjure and control spirits and demons, contained spells and incantations that were beneficial to the user, and spells that would duplicate some of the bi biblical plagues of Egypt. Today, all of the stories and claims of spells, hexes, magic books, and incantations sound rather silly, but they were all common traditions of the Pennsylvania Dutch country of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It might be hard for us to believe today, but people at that time and place readily accepted such ideas. And that is the most crucial point of the hex murders. Those involved truly believed in magic. They believed that it worked and it could ruin their lives. And they would do anything to try and stop that from happening. Let's talk about John Blymeyer. His family had been powwowers for at least three generations and probably longer. He was born in 1895, learned the art of German folk magic at a young age, and started providing healing remedies and cures at the age of seven. Despite doing poorly in school, he had established a good reputation as a healer in York County. One day, as he was leaving the cigar factory where he worked, a rabid dog began running towards some of his fellow workers. So Blymeyer approached the dog spoke some words of a spell, and the dog's mouth stopped foaming and the animal became subdued. It followed him excitedly for several blocks, the other workers amazed by the dog's cure. Despite this, his early success, Blymeyer began to believe that there was a shadow hanging over him. He became ill, found himself unable to eat, sleep, or work his powwow magic. He started to believe that a hex had been put upon him. Then one night, just as the clock struck midnight, an owl outside hooted seven times. So this indicated to Blymeyer that he had been hexed by the spirit of his great-grandfather Jacob, who had been a pow powwower and the seventh son of a seventh son, which is, of course, extremely powerful. Since Blymeyer could not fight back against his spirit, he moved away from his ancestral home in the cemetery where his great-grandfather was buried, hopefully breaking the spell. For a time, it seemed to work. Blymeyer worked doing odd jobs along with his powwowing, through which he met and married a young woman named Lily. The couple had two children, but both died in infancy. These tragic occurrences led Blymeyer to once again believe that he had been hexed. Unable to determine the source for the new hex, he turned to other powwowers from, for help. One of them, a man named Andrew Lenhart, convinced Blymeyer that the source of the hex was someone he knew very well. This led Blymeyer to become suspicious of everyone around him, even his wife. Lily began to fear for her safety, especially since in 1922, one of Lenhart's other clients, 
murdered her husband after receiving similar information that he'd given to Blymeyer. Sally Jane Hagee shot her husband Irving in bed after Lenhart was hired to drive the witches from her home. Sally did not believe the treatment worked and was in terrible physical pain. She finally snapped one day, killed her husband, and later committed suicide in jail. Lily was terrified the same thing was going to happen with Blymeyer, so she was able to have him committed to an insane asylum. The doctors determined that he was obsessed with hexes and magic and needed treatment. Soon after, Lily filed for divorce and it was granted. But 48 days after he was committed, Blymeyer simply walked out the door and vanished. No one even bothered to look for him. It wouldn't have been hard to find him because he went right back to work at the cigar factory in 1928. While he was there, he met two other people who also believed that they were hexed. One of them, 14-year-old John Curry, was trapped in an abusive household and felt that a malevolent force was causing the trouble at home. A farmer named Milton Hess also believed he had been hexed. Hess and his wife Alice enjoyed success until 1926 when unfortunate events began to plague their farm. Crops failed, cows stopped producing milk, and they lost a large amount of money. The talk of hexes reinforced Blymeyer's own belief in spells, and he became terrified by the idea that someone was out to get him. He began to consult other powwowers, attempting to track down the source of the hexes. He consulted with Nellie Knoll, the so-called River Witch of Marietta. She identified the source of the hex as a member of the Reimer family. When Blymeyer asked which one, she placed a dollar bill on his palm, and when she removed it, an image of Nelson Reinheimer appeared on Blymeyer's palm. Blymeyer had known Reinheimer, a distant relative, since he was a child. In fact, when Blymeyer was five, he became seriously ill. His father and grandfather, unable to cure him, took him to Reinheimer, who did heal him. Baffled by why Reinheimer would wish him harm, Blymeyer went to see Noel again. She confirmed that not only had Reinheimer hexed him, but that he had also hexed John Curry and Milton and Alice Hess. The solution for ending all the curse hexes, curses, whichever, was to take Reinheimer's copy of The Long Lost Friend and a lock of Reinheimer's, Reinheimer's hair and bury them six feet underground. Blymeyer and Curry decided to go to Reinheimer's Hollow and obtain the needed items. So on November 26th, which is, by the way, is a great date. That's my birthday. The Hess's oldest son, Clayton, drove Blymeyer and Curry to the hollow. The address they had for Reimeyer turned out to be for his former wife, Alice, but she sent them on to his house, which was a mile down the road. As fellow powwowers, Blymeyer engaged Reimeyer so many Myers, in discussion of the long-lost friend and other elements of their mutual craft, never indicating that he was aware of the hexes Rymeyer had cast. Since the conversation lasted long into the night, Rymeyer invited them to sleep downstairs. Since Rymeyer was much bigger and meaner looking than Blymeyer remembered, they used this opportunity to search for the book but had no luck. They debated on whether or not to try and obtain a lock of Reimeyer's hair, but finally decided he was too big for them to hold down while they cut his hair. The pair left in the morning, agreeing they needed more help. I need coffee. Milton Hess offered his 18-year-old son Wilbert as an assistant, so the next evening, November 27th, Blymeyer, Curry, and Wilbert arrived at Rymeyer's house. He brought them into the parlor, but never got the chance to wonder why they were there again. When his back was turned, the men tackled him to the floor and attempted to tie his legs. The exact details of what happened next varied slightly depending on which man told the story, but during the struggle, Rymeyer was beaten and strangled to death. It is possible that Blymeyer had always intended to kill Rymeyer, but if he did, he did not reveal his plans to the other two men. 
When they realized that Rymeyer was dead, they took all of the money in the house, leaving behind the book and a lock of the old man's hair. He was dead. The curse had been lifted, they thought. They doused the body with kerosene and lit it on fire. When they left, Rymeyer's body was en engulfed in flames, but somehow the fire mysteriously went out before the house went up. Two days later, a neighbor discovered Rymeyer's body. Alice Rymeyer informed the police of Blymeyer and Curry's visit, and they were soon picked up as suspects. Neither of the men denied the crime as they felt they were acting in self-defense against the hexes Rymeyer had cast. Newspapers across the country covered the story of the York witchcraft murder with great interest. Every bizarre detail of Blymeyer's hex-obsessed life was described for the public. When the men went to trial, there were daily reports of the proceedings. In the end, Hess received 10 years in prison, but Blymeyer and Curry ended up receiving life sentences for the murder. Both were eventually paroled and lived uneventful lives. Curry, the youngest, served in the military during World War II and became a talented artist. The Hex murder in York County received wide coverage, and while the local authorities did not launch any official invest assault on folk magic in the area, the press and authorities in other parts of the state, state certainly did. The newspaper coverage of the case brought intense scrutiny to folk practices, and they were labeled a form of witchcraft. The press maligned all practitioners of powwowing, even if they only practiced the most benign healing services. Lurid descriptions of magic and strange beliefs filled the newspapers and shocked Americans who were unaware that such things were still taking place in the 20th century. Law enforcement officials, doctors, and educators began working together to put an end to what they considered superstitious and dangerous practices. Many of them began attributing supernatural motivations to any strange cases that they encountered. During the Raymeyer tr murder trial, York County Coroner L.V. Zack claimed that, there were, that the deaths of five children in the previous two years had been caused by powwowers. He said their parents took them to folk, folk healers instead of real doctors and that that caused their deaths. There had been no formal investigations of these cases, but he insisted that they were a matter of common knowledge. The New York Times ran a story under the dramatic headline, Death of Five Babies Laid to Witch Cult. The newspaper quoted unnamed officials of the York County Medical Society who said that the coroner's count of deaths attributed to witchcraft was much too low. Well, now things really got rolling. Soon, any death that was even vaguely connected to a powwow was labeled a hex murder. March 1929, the body of Verna Delp, 21, was discovered in the woods near Allentown. On her body were three pieces of paper with magical charms written on them, supposedly to protect from murder and theft. The coroner's report identified three poisons in her body and it appeared she had taken them voluntarily. August Durhammer, her adopted father, revealed that Verna was taking treatments from a powwower named Charles T. Bells and that she had been planning to visit him on the day that she died. He was arrested the police convinced that they had another hex murder on their hands. Bells at first tried to deny he was treating Ver Verna, but he later admitted, admitted that he was treating her, but only for eczema, or eczema, whichever way you want to say it. He claimed to be only a faith healer, not a hex doctor, but no one believed him, and even though there was no evidence to link him to the crime, they kept him in jail. It was discovered that Verna was pregnant, though, and she had not seen her boyfriend, a truck driver named Masters, for several months. She had been possibly looking for a way to end the pregnancy. But the obsession with hexes and powwow distracted the police from other possibilities in the case, including a botched abortion attempt, suicide, or murder by someone other than Bells. By April, they still had no evidence against Bells, but he was charged anyway. He finally received a hearing in mid-April and was released on $10,000 bail. This is like in, what, 1929, 1930? That's a lot of money. Charges were eventually dropped 
and the murder of Verna Delp was never solved. In January 1930, Mrs. Harry MacDonald, 34, a housewife from Reading, died after receiving severe burns in her home. She had been given an ointment from a hex doctor with instructions to rub it on her skin. When she got too close to her stove, her body went up in flames. When her husband found her, she was on the verge of death and could not be saved. Her brother told reporters that he believed the lotion she was using was flammable and caught fire, killing his sister. He had no evidence of this, but the press latched onto this theory and kept the story alive with occult connections for weeks. Okay, the sun's coming around, so I'm just going to reset the camera a bit, and we'll continue. And we're back. So now, on January 20th, 1932, the body of a man named Norman Bechtel, 31, was discovered. There were nine stab wounds in and around his heart. A crescent-shaped cut was made on each side of his forehead, and a vertical slash ran from his hairline to his nose. Two additional cuts ran off the vertical slash in direction of the crescent cuts. All of his valuables were taken, and his car was discovered six miles away. The bloodstains in the car indicated Bechtel had known his attacker well enough to let them into his car. The case appeared to be a robbery gone bad, but then there were those pesky facial cuts, which might have special occult significance. Since Bechtel had grown up near Boyertown, where powwow was common, the police immediately started searching for evidence of another hex murder. Captain Harry Heenley, the chief investigator, searched for any possible with connection with folk magic, but found none. After following a few more leads, the police still had no answers, so the press began calling the mystery a hex murder. Then, in April 1937, William Jordan, 36, confessed that he and four others had killed Bechtel, who they had been attempting to blackmail. The details of Jordan's confession were not publicly released, but the murder had nothing to do with magic. If these cases had been the only ones tied to powwow, it's likely that the hex scare would have died out sooner and the public would have lost interest. But then an actual hex murder occurred in 1934, which sealed the fate of folk magic in the state for decades to come. The last true hex murder occurred in Pottsville on Saturday, March 17, 1934. Mrs. Susan Mummy, 63, Mummy is in M-U-M-M-E-Y, 63, was tending the injured foot of Jacob Rice when the oil lamp that her daughter was holding shattered as a shot tore through the window. Mummy was killed and the other two took cover, not knowing if more shots would follow. They waited all night in fear, but as morning approached, Rice made the trip to Ringtown to report the crime. Initially, the police thought the murder was the result of a feud that had turned violent. But things became bizarre when Albert Shinsky, 24, confessed to the killing. He claimed that the killing had been self-defense and that Mummy had placed a hex on him. Seven years earlier, there had been a dispute over property lines, and when he was working in a field across from her farm, Mummy came over to the fence and stared at him for a long time. He claimed that a cold perspiration came over him and his arms went limp. From that point on, he was unable to work. But that was just the start. Shinsky said that whenever he saw a sharp object, it would change into a black cat with flaming eyes from which he could not look away. The cat also sometimes appeared at night. It would creep slowly across the room and jump onto the bed. The cat made him so cold he had to get up and run around the room to get warm again. He sought help from several powwowers, but nothing worked. His family thought he was lying and was just too lazy to work, but Shinsky seemed to genuinely believe that he was hexed. Eventually, he could take no more and he killed Mummy. He told the police that the minute she died, he felt the curse lift from his shoulders. Prosecutors, of course, wanted Shinsky put to death for the murder, emphasizing the danger of the practice of folk magic. 
But despite objections from the police and the prosecutor's office, doctors ruled Shinsky insane and he was sent to the Fairview State Hospital. He remained in mental institutions for the rest of his life. This second confirmed hex murder cemented it for the gentle, general public, though. Witchcraft was a threat to society. Kauauer still had plenty of defenders, but the tide of public opinion had turned against them. Pennsylvania's school system declared war on the belief in hexes, especially in rural areas where it seemed most prevalent. It was hoped a new focus on modern medicine and science would erase the superstitions that seemed to plague the countryside. Authorities also moved against powwowers and hex doctors directly, arresting and prosecuting them for practicing medicine without a license. Except for the brave few who had public storefronts, most powwowers avoided the public spotlight and downplayed their work to non-believers. They did continue to provide services to those who sought them out, but as time went on, the younger generations showed little interest in learning the old ways of healing in hexes. Still, the practice refused to die out completely. Many modern healers still exist today, and German folk magic remains alive and well. Let's hope there isn't another hex murder anytime soon. I hope you enjoyed a good yarn. Thanks for joining me. And I will see you next time. Bye.